And then the three at the top, three Hebrew commentators at the top of the mountain. There are many commentators, but the three at the top are Rashi, year 1090, he was a Vinter, and, uh, and the major commentator on the meanings of the individual Hebrew words. Uh, 1090, 100 years later, 1190, Maimonides, and Maimonides, uh, that's the, the, the guys that are perplexed, in which he makes that statement that I just read. And he also says, if you want to understand God, the first place you have to start is with nature. He said, you can't, it doesn't mean how you run your life, that has to be very clear. You don't need to know nature to how you run your life. But if you want to know how God interacts in this world, he says the reason that the Torah, that the Bible starts with the creation sentence, is chapter one, the creation chapter, is because that's the physical creation of the world. If you understand God's interaction in the world, what you need is understanding nature. And then from there he calls it he calls it in Hebrew Madat Elokut and Madat Teva. The science of nature precedes an understanding of the science of God. The science of God is what some people call uh, Kabbalah. It's the spiritual physics of the world. Kabbalah is not mysticism. You can get a mystical experience with Kabbalah. But Kabbalah is the deep workings of God within the world. And if that doesn't give you a spiritual answer, you know, is that because that's for your body, then you haven't studied, you haven't understood it your way. So, the, uh, so ancient commentary, that would be Maimonides in the year 1190, Rashi 1090, Maimonides 1190, and then Nachmanides, Ramban Nachmanides with an N, very similar names, in the year 1250, and he is the major Kabbalistic commentary on the Torah. He's the top of the mountain, on the Torah itself. And uh, some of the things that he teaches are easy to understand and some not, but that, those are the sources. So all, long before any, any supposedly scientific understanding of the world would be a concept. So with that, that background, try to understand what one or two of the easier problems uh, with which to deal. And what I'd like to deal with is a bit of, of an evolution, and the other would be uh, the age of the universe. So that's, unless are there other topics that you're on, just small topics that you're on, you're not know, very shaped down to it. So if that's, if that's acceptable, and, and it's rushing out because you can't really hear something else, uh, that's, so we'll, we'll, start with, we'll start with that. The, uh, actually, I have here some sheets. And since part of it is biblical text, isn't probably enough for one at each table, or maybe two at each table, but I have to get them back, okay? So don't, don't uh, write on them, please. Don't sum them up. Because, because Passover, the Passover is only about a month and a few weeks away, and I don't want any this le leavened bread on my, on my papers, okay? So, uh, <laughs> so uh, shake it off before you bring it back, okay? So, so they should all be the same, they're all copied on two sides. I can leave one copy here, eventually if anybody wants copies, because I've, what I've done is I've, I've crossed out many of the, not all, many of the mistranslations. The problem with every translation is, the translator has a spin. You know, you just can't, because no one language translates perfectly to another. Okay, so somebody crossed out some of the more obvious mistranslations. And uh, I just, just, I would suggest, that, Take not more than two at a table. If there are only three persons at the table, just take one from the table and look over the shoulders. And they should all be the same, copied on both sides. Uh, so take one for it, just pass it back. I apologize, I don't have more. And again, I have to take it back at the end because I, I do need uh, Make sure I have a few more. If you run out back there, I just want to work on it. So, so the, uh, just one topic that I'll start with is, as I said, the age of the age of the universe. And for understanding the age of the universe, and I'm probably going to write on this board, on this wall here, so they say like, that's like, like Daniel, right? Writing on the, uh, on the wall. So, uh, I, I, it's too small, it seems to be short to, uh, to correct me. I'll, I'll raise your hand if you can't for a great one. The, uh, if, I, if I want to understand the age of the universe from a biblical point of view or a science point of view, I have to know the numbers to begin with. If I take the biblical text, the Hebrew Bible, and I add up all the generations, 
from Adam to the five books of Moses and then King Solomon, etc. after to the end of the biblical text. So I get a number, because the age was a given. And then I add the, the secular rulers on after the kings, the queens, the pharaohs, whatever they happen to be. And I get to a number that's less than 6,000 years. I think the number at the moment, there's some question, of course, why it's going to hear, but the, just the number that we understand at the moment, most, most persons would be 50, 7, 72 years. And these are the Bible data. And that number, as I say, is back by adding up the generations. We see the, and we get to, at the end of the text, we get to a number that doesn't even reach 6,000 years. At the other end of the scale, so I've never had a wall like this to write on it. This is really this is what, Daniel, what Daniel had going for him. No wonder he didn't do it. It's only my book, I do. We get, a, uh, we get something called a creation, properly called the Big Bang. Now, the term the Big Bang does not include within it what made the Big Bang go bang. That's very clear. It does not, I say, say it does, the term the Big Bang does not say what created the universe. The term the Big Bang is just a secular way of saying there was a creation. Because you can imagine, if a secular, a secular scientist who thinks you're going to things like the, you know, the last thing you want, and he has to say creation, the universe created, it sounds like, what does it sound like? God, yeah, God forbid. So we use the word, we use the, we word, we use the word instead of the Big Bang. It was coined by Fred Hoyle, not going the origin of Fred Hoyle, who was an avid, avid believer in an eternal universe. Until he made some phenomenal discoveries and it changed him totally. Because God is in the details. That's where it just wells up. And Fred Hoyle was being, he then became Sir Fred Hoyle, he's the person that discovered how the elements are formed within the, the pressures of the stars. The Big Bang didn't produce carbon, didn't produce oxygen, it produced energy. And Einstein caught the world that energy could metamorphose and become solid matter. But it didn't become the heavier elements, initially just hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen is maybe uh, good for making water. Yes, it got oxygen, but heat oxygen also. And the heavier elements are made within the stars. It was Hoyle that discovered how to do how that happened. And he became Sir Fred Hoyle. In the 1950s and into the 60s, he was among the, the large group of scientists the overwhelming majority of scientists, in fact, you can, you can look up surveys on the web that go back 50 and 60 years asking scientists, a person who are active in, the, in, in astronomy, cosmology, thermodynamics, the age of the universe, and the split was usually, that I have seen, is two-thirds of the scientists held by the fact that the universe is eternal, the Greek view of the world. Only one third felt, felt, third felt that the Bible got it correct, that there was a creation. They didn't necessarily believe in God, but there was a creation. Hoyle was in that group of persons that felt the universe was eternal. And he was being interviewed on the BBC, the British Broadcasting uh, Corporation radio program. And to give like little, you know, little zits, we see it in, in the world, to, the, to Hoyle, the interviewer said, well, Professor Hoyle, what do you think about those persons that say the universe had a creation? And he said, ah, I think it was some kind of a big bang. The press picked it up. Since that time, we've been using his term. It was coined, we think, almost certainly as a group of double derision, and it became the term that we use for today. Boyle later discovered the nuance. The, I don't, we don't have time to get into all of these things. I have a website that I deal with, with some of the, the aspects. But uh, Boyle later discovered how it was possible within the pressure cookers, the centers of the stars, to form the heavier elements. We just take it for granted that we have these elements, but there are major stumbling blocks in how, how the elements get built from the smaller to the bigger. Hydrogen is number one, helium is number two, but then you got to get lithium, brilliant, put up across the table, and they build together like Lego blocks, but huge pressure, because you're pushing the nucleus, the centers of these of these atoms together. And if anyone's worked with two two magnets, you ever try to push the plus and the plus together? You literally cannot. They always slip apart. The minus to the plus go right together, no problem. But to put the plus to the plus, it's impossible. We multiply that by approximately a factor of a bit of a million, and that's the forces that it takes to get two nuclei to come together, because they're both positively charged. We get to the next element by adding the previous one onto it. Well, uh, Hoyle discovered how that happened. He became first surfing at Hoyle, and at that point he changed his understanding, and he said there's no, there's no possibility 
in a logical understanding of the world that this, these laws that allow this to happen are by chance. These words, as he said, because it's some super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as the chemistry and the biology, and, and it's so, totally it's just illogical to think that it can happen by chance. It's the, it's the tuning of the universe for complex life. So we have a creation here, and the line now has an end because we've discovered, thanks to work with, with the Keck Telescope in, in Hawaii and the Hubble Telescope in space, that the universe seems to be about 14 billion years old. I'm using American terminology, nine zeros. 14 billion years, at least in the science data. And we get that number by looking out to space and we see that the galaxies are all moving apart. And we can actually measure the rate at which they're moving apart. So if, it, if, the, ga if the galaxies, like these two galaxies, are this separated, and then they move to this next year, and next year, and next year, if we know the rate that they're going out, so just change the equation to a negative instead of a positive, this year to last year, from billions of years ago to billions of years ago. We look at the rate of expansion of the universe, if we run the equation backward in time, it takes in the order of 14 billion years for everything to come together into a great burst of energy called the creation of the universe. So that goes to, those are the data with which we work. We're trying to understand how we can have one reality, the age of the universe, viewed from two vastly different perspectives and both being literally true. How? Without thinking the Bible. So the first thing we have to understand is the biblical calendar. We see how we get this number, but the question is where does this number begin? from what phenomenal event in the history of the universe happened on the biblical new year called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh means head, Ha means the, Shana means year, the head of the year. The biblical Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Bible's biblical new year, which occurs in uh, September, October. Go back 57, 72 years, and does anyone know what the origin of the biblical calendar is? What major, major event in the history of the universe? Adam. Take your pardon? Adam. No? Yeah? Adam. Yeah. The biblical calendar begins with the creation of humanity. It's very interesting. The Bible's calendar begins with the first of the human being. Day zero in the calendar is here. We don't have a lot of time this today to get into all the nuances here. But the calendar then would say the following. But if you look at the text, Genesis chapter 1 is broken into six days. There are 31 sentences. By verse 26, we have Adam. And by verse 27 of those 31 sentences, we have the creation of Adam. So I just call it six days, but it's really five and a half days according to the Talmud, according to the text. There are six days from the creation to Adam. And then from Adam forward are the 57, 72 years. So right off the bat, we can start having answers because we now know the age of the universe as of the last new year was not 5772 years. It was 5772 years plus, plus what? Exactly, plus six days. Okay, the bells are ringing for me and my gal. Yes, up, up, up. I hear ringing. Uh, so the calendar is split into two parts. Now why would that be the case? Because if you look at the text that's in front of you that I passed around, you notice that at each day, and again the translations are not great, but we'll just go with it because of the timing, that at each day, at the end of each day, like verse number five, there was evening and morning one day. Verse number eight, evening and morning a second day. Verse number 13, the third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, the sixth day. For the entire passage of the six days, the description of time is totally independent of human activity. Humans have mentioned their day, for, day number six, but, but the passage has totally related to evening and morning day one, evening and morning the second day. Only in chapter five of the book of Genesis does the calendar begin again. And it begins with Adam, it says, Adam and Eve lived 130 years, have a child named Seth. It's about chapter five, verse two or three. Adam and Eve live 130 years, have a child named Seth. Seth lives 105 years, with a child named Enoch. From Adam forward, every passage of time is related to humans. 
There's no passage of time in the Torah after that that is not human based. So there are two calendars because the, because the description of time is totally different. Here we can call this almost cosmic time. You know, no relationship to the earth, it mentions the earth eventually, but no, no intimate relationship to it, just the same phrase over and over, evening and morning, which is a defective phrase, but I, I, of course, at the end we have time, we can get into it, we'll see how, how the time goes, yeah, too many. So we have a break here. Now, I, I can't get off the track on Adam and Eve and humans uh, other than one aspect here. If you look at the text, because persons will say, well, I went to the museum and I saw people going back 50,000 years and 70,000 years. And pottery, we know, was invented 8,000 years, 9,000 years ago. And, and farming, right, right in my hometown, Jerusalem, but a bit further north of Israel and Syria, touch, 10,000 years. You know, I've been to the museum, so what are you telling me the first people are 57, 72 years? There's a nuance here that I want to go, go hit on at the moment and then jump to the age of the universe. But just to get this out of the way, one or two sentences. Please look at verse number 26. On the side of the page has wisdom written at the top of the page. Verse number 26 says, Let us make Adam. Okay, the mistranslation is crossed out. Not a set Adam. Let us make Adam. Interesting. I jump to verse number on the second side of the page. Verse 27 says, So God created the Adam. The English misses it totally. That's the problem. I urge you. If you don't know Hebrew, you're trying to understand the, the, Hebrew, the, the Hebrew text for the five books of Moses. Get at least five translations. I said, seriously. And whenever there's a difference, you'll know that they're wrong. Because if one was right, you wouldn't have the others. I mean, it's such clear logic. So the Hebrew, the English misses totally, because you'll notice under the crossed out word, just that God created humanity or mankind. No, verse number six did not let us make Adam, not say Adam, but verse number 27 doesn't say God created Adam. It says God created the Adam, et ha Adam. I, we have to be, especially with work coming up, I have to give it the name of Peggy Ketson. Others have said it, but she, I learned it from her, from a woman from Hawaii, here at Ono. God makes Adam, but God creates the Adam. Now, all of biblical commentary, ancient commentary, and all of science today holds by the fact that there was one physical creation. Souls are different. One creation of physical stuff which eventually became alive. It's called the Big Bang creation. So then how, so then Nachmanides, the, the Kabbalah again, this, the, this, this deeper understanding, asks the question. So how can it say in verse number 21, going back, that God creates this big list of animals? Most of which are translated incorrectly, but God created this animal, this, 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 okay. And it's, it says, how can it say God created? And his, his, his language is so clear. He says, when everyone knows there's only one physical creation, this is a thousand years ago. Everyone knows there's only one physical creation, so it's not a physical creation, then what must it be? It's either physical or? Exactly. It's the nephesh, the Hebrew word for the soul of animals. We know the animals are already there. Look at verse 20. That's just the animals. But the creation, 21, brings the nephesh, the soul of animals, into, into this world. That is a creation, but it's spiritual. And verse 26 gives us Adam, let us make Adam. So why do I need the creation of the Adam in verse 27? The neshama, the Hebrew word for the soul of humans. All animals have a nephesh. Only humans have a nephesh and a neshama. The nephesh says, cheat in the supermarket, throw your garbage in the street, cut in line. The neshama says, you have your mind? You're a human being. Other people, you want to get in line and they get the last seat in the bus, get up earlier. They got up before you, they get the seat. You put what? The nephew said, yeah, they might not understand, it's a five-hour bus ride. You know, I'm going from uh, Tel Aviv down to Ela. I'm not going to stand in line. And then the nephew said, the good news is, there's two seats left, and I'm number, si I'm, I'm number six, but four of the people ahead of me are cripples. I no problem, just put them out of the way. The nephew says that, every human being has it in him. And the neshama says, you want to get on the bus? Get up earlier. The nephew and the neshama fight all the time. Every human being has it, and, and that's the battle that we say. Should we get up in time to get to services on time, or should I just play around in bed? Well, you know, I watch the movies at 3 in the morning, so I don't want to get up just yet. In other words, I mean, that's the battle. Animals don't have that problem. They throw the garbage in the street, they don't even care. Humans do care, and they can't trick the neshama. The neshama is your access to God, and every time you cheat the supermarket, throw your garbage in the street, or cut in line, your neshama moves one step back. 
from your contact with God. Every human being has it, and we have that battle day by day. And there, there are people that are, a narcissist would be more interested in his, her, her, her nephew than in the shama, because the narcissist is just me, 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 you know, that's all that matters. We, how animals act as well. So anyway, so we have so we have two sentences that lead to the creation, the making of Adam. So verse 26 says, let us make Adam, but God creates the Adam. The break in the calendar is therefore not Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, but Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. That's the break here. So actually the six days happens actually to be five and a half days, not really six days, until the calendar splits. There are six days, but the second half of the sixth day, maybe after five and a half days go by from this, that falls into this part of the calendar here, on the other side of the line, because the neshama is there, and with the creation of the human, the first human, with the first being with the neshama, the calendar starts here. When a museum says, says in, the, in the exhibit that uh, you know, 50,000 years ago, people started, or well, humans, right, started inventing complex tools, and 10,000 years ago, they invented farming, the museum is correct by its definition of a person or a human. The definition of a museum of a human or a person is a being that looks like us, has our intelligence. My mind talks about these beings 900 years ago, the guy for the reflex. Beings existed. Where did you get the information 900 years ago? Beings existed that had human shape, human intelligence. If that human intelligence, but they weren't humans, they didn't have an ashama. It's the creation. So the museum is correct. By their definition, a being that looks like us and has our intellect, but we would call them homo sapiens sapiens, or hominids, not humanoids, hominids, those, hominids. The Bible's definition of a human is a being that looks like us, has our intelligence, and also has a neshama, exactly. So the museums aren't wrong. The, 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 the former head, the late head, Rabbi Noah Weinberg, of blessed memory, where I teach in Jerusalem, said if you're going to have a discussion, the first thing you have to do is define your terms. You know what you're talking about. The museums are correct by their definition of a human, but not by the biblical definition. So the question is, what are you dealing with? So this is literally true. These are the first humans. How many to go back on this side of the line? I don't know how many days, but we'll figure that out in a moment. So we have six days, five and a half days, leading up to the first human being within, the first being within the Shaman, the first human. And from there, 57, 72 years till we get today. So the child's answer usually is, we've all probably heard that, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but you probably haven't really heard it. The days weren't days, they were long periods of time. I mean, you know, the, the, why would, and the fact that the Bible says, they does the Bible know? You know, it doesn't know Hebrew, so just, you know, it slaps it around each day. Well, that's rather ridiculous, but that's usually the argument. The difficulty is, or the good news is, that the three major commentators on the meanings of the words in the, in the Bible, especially the Torah, give us the duration of each biblical day. It's just extraordinary. The whole question, the problem never existed. And that, those three would be the Talmud. That's written down up to year 400. And then there in the Talmud, Rashi, the famous Rashi, up to year 1090. And then the major Kabbalistic commentary, Nachmanides, the year 1250, but he's a Mikubal. It wasn't his idea. The Kabbalah needs to receive. He gets it from his teachers, he gets it from their teachers back back. As he says, it all comes from Sinai in the first place. And all three, and these are the only three commentators. There's a Psalm 90, a thousand years in your sight, like a day that passes, Psalm 90, verse 4, but it doesn't relate to the six days. These, these, are, the only, these are the only three commentators that deal with the duration of the days and they save all the argument and give the exact answer. Say that each day lasted 24 hours each. There's no divergence of this in, in ancient biblical commentary. Don't walk out just yet. Please. <laughs> all three. These are the only three. There are no others. I mean, the whole range of, of biblical scholars I've discussed it with you. I have no question about it. In any event, but the commentary is slightly more complex than this. The commentary reads like this. The days are days. They're 24 hours each, not sunrise, sunset. The sun's not mentioned until the fourth day. 
or the Talmud says was there on the second or third day, but not the first day for certain. So we're not talking about sunrise, sunset. We're talking about units of 24 hours. The days are days. They're 24 hours each. The next thing, the Hebrew is Kamo Sheshit Me'avodah, not longer than the six days of our work week. Can't say the hours are different. Six 24 hour days, not longer than the six days of our work week, contain all the ages of the universe. Kolel, 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 Six 24 hour days, not longer than the six days of our work week, contain all the ages of the universe. Possible? Absolutely. Two views of one perspective. Notice the time is described totally differently here than here. We've talked about that before. So something's going on here. Why did the calendar split at that point? And Nachmanides brings the reason. The total reason it is, it's just so obvious that it's almost embarrassing that I didn't figure it out myself. But he beat me to it by 800 years. Nor did anyone else figure it out that he came along. At the end of each day, the day is numbered. If you take the trouble to look at the sheets that were passed around, and in verse number five, there's evening and morning, day one. There's evening and morning, one day, or day one. Verse number eight, evening and morning, a second day, Yom Verse 13, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, the sixth day. Now, Humanity says, wow. He just says, wow. Why does the form of the number change? Notice the form of the traffic number changes. Evening and morning, day one. But not evening and morning, the second day. I mean, not even going day two. This is a second day, a third day. Why does the form of the number change from the absolute one, Yom Echad, one? Why didn't it say first? A first day. It's a second day, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day. I mean, it's, why not give me a first day? And we're told by Nachmanides, by the others as well, but Nachmanides, that the Torah could not write a first, there was evening and morning, a first day on the first day, because the only time you can write first is when it's relative to a, a second. And there hadn't been a second day on the first day. Now that's kind of interesting, because I give Nachmanides the benefit of the doubt, and I think he read the Bible a few times. So he knew the Torah wasn't given away back here, the Torah is given, the Bible, you know, the Revelation, is on Sinai, right, to Moses. Way out here on the timeline. Not the scale, obviously. If I add up all the generations from Adam to Moses on Sinai, which I can do, they're all in the text, the number comes up, it's a quite well-known number in biblical uh, 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 studies. It's 2,448 years from Adam to Moses on Sinai times 365 days a year, comes out to be approximately just under 900,000 days. Why is Nachmanis telling me that in the second day? By the time the Torah is given on Sinai, there have been hundreds of thousands of second days. And his way makes the breakthrough. If the view of the Torah, I'm going to say Torah, the five books of Moses, if the view of the Torah for Genesis were from Sinai looking back, the Torah would have written there was evening and morning of first day. Because by Sinai, there have been hundreds of thousands of first days, about 900,000 of those days. If the view were from Sinai looking back, the Torah would have written there was evening and morning of first day. But Nachmanides writes, the fact that the Torah says day one is because the Torah sees time from the only time in the history of time when there hadn't been a second day. And that's on the first day. Why should that have interested a, a biblical, a theologian, almost a thousand years ago? See time, we see, what do we see time? Where it doesn't matter, time is time. I mean, that was one of uh, Newton's, the only, I think the only mistake Isaac Newton ever made in his Principia Mathematica. He says, time stands pristine, unaffected by events. <laughs> Beautiful statement, but wrong. <laughs> we look back in, the, in time from uh, up to Adam and we see 14 billion years. But the other half of the sentence, as everyone that works in this field knows, is the universe is 14 billion years old as measured from the position, it's called the time space coordinates, of measured from the position of the Earth today. That's the other half of the sentence. Make the measurement of the age of the universe from any other perspective, you get a different number. 
we just say 14 billion years old because that's how else we live. And those years went by. But any other location in the universe would give you another give you another number. 14 billion years old as measured from the time space coordinates of the Earth. The Torah, the Bible, does does it from the six days of Genesis. Says day one because the Torah says we see that we we was not Matis points out that day one is seeing time from the beginning looking forward. To how old is the universe? Oh, about six days. We look back in time, but billions of years went by. We live in that time. But how would it be perceived? The operational word here is perceived. How would time be perceived from the biblical point of view? That's the question that we with which I'd like to deal now. How would it be? Well, the universe begins as a burst of energy. And the universe then expands out. But the universe can't be getting bigger by, by new space being added on, like an onion or a cabbage, or lettuce, or layers and layers, there'd be new space. But everyone holds by the fact that this is the only physical creation of space, energy, and matter. So how's the universe getting bigger? This gets bigger by space stretching. It's fundamental to our understanding of the universe. There's no new space. There's more space, but it's produced are created by space stretching. The galaxies are moving apart because the space between them is stretching and carrying them apart. We look back in the universe and we see billions of years. The Bible looks to the forward and claims six days up to Adam. And they both are probably true. I mean, the Bible says it, why wouldn't I believe it? And if science says it, you know, they made some mistakes, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the numbers are, are getting better. When I go to Joseph Jones to the Big Bang, the numbers were between 10 and 20 billion years old. By the time the second book was about 15 billion, now it's here in 14 billion years. It's getting closer and closer with this, with this slack, is less and less. How is it possible to see from the beginning and call days with these are billions of years? So a quick thought experiment. Over here, over here we have a great big telescope. I mean, this is a big telescope. And we're watching a galaxy. This galaxy is really far away. I mean, it's so far away that it takes millions and millions and millions of years for the light to travel through space for us to see it on our telescope. But we don't see it on our telescope when things are happening. We see it millions and millions of years later, like the sun. We look at the sun and say, wow, the sun, but we're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes and about 15 seconds ago. Because it takes about eight minutes and 15 seconds. If the sun disappeared right now, God forbid it should happen. Okay? Well, man, who knows? Maybe the world becomes better. And if the sun disappeared, maybe, right, and we wouldn't know about it, right? We could do, we could do repentance for the next eight minutes. But, but, you, but you wouldn't know. But you wouldn't know it anyway. So, you got to always figure you got eight minutes. But, what would this be? So, we're watching this, we're watching this galaxy, and the galaxy is really far away. I mean, it's really far away. So, think. On the galaxy, a star explodes for a supernova. A huge burst of light. The light goes out in all directions, but let's just talk about the light coming towards us, okay? Super, big burst of energy. Light travels for a whole week, and light travels really fast, like 300 million meters a second, so in a week it's moved a lot. A week later, another star explodes. Two supernovas separate by one week. Amazing. We don't know it yet, because it hasn't reached our telescope. Now, so, the, so this one has traveled a whole week of, 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 of light speed towards us, then the second burst. And as they travel through time and space, What's space doing? So what happens to the bursts? They get further and further apart. The first burst hits our telescope. Wow, a supernova, break out the beer, friends, let's celebrate. <laughs> Boom. Does the next burst hit the telescope a week later? If the universe doubled in size, it would hit the universe with the telescope two weeks later. If the universe was a million times stretched, it would a million weeks later. So I, I just say a, a, a double in size. So one week, and then now two weeks later it arrives. But I want to know what it was like back there at the galaxy. Well, that moment doesn't exist by millions and millions of years. It's time to, to get, I have to go back mathematically, not physically, but mathematically, I have to go back in time. I call up an astronomer, how far is the galaxy? How much is space stretch? He gives me the number, factor of two. And now I've got these first two weeks apart. But as I go back in time, what's space doing? Getting larger or smaller? And the two weeks become? One week. Two views. One reality. I'm not money. I get some of the goosebumps. My kids in cover. Yeah, you're here standing up on it. How do you, how do you know it? Why did it matter? 
two views of one reality. Our reality is the billions of years went by. How would they be perceived from this biblical point of view? Well, the Bible makes a claim about five and a half days. Let's see what Nachmanides will say. Nachmanides tells us, as Thomas, uh, Thomas says exactly the same thing. First of all, I didn't thank John for inviting me. I apologize for that. I so <laughs> <laughs> I really apologize. I really not. He said, I'm sure I'm saying it seriously, but it doesn't really. Anyway, Nachmanides, I mean, I said Thomas, as I heard, that uh, time is created here. But then a nuance is added. He writes the following. Time is created here, but the biblical clock only begins when matter forms. He writes, Mish ye yesh yifos fos man. The moment you have matter yesh, time grabs a hold. He verse tofest, grabs. The moment you have matter, time grabs a hold. Now that E into M transition took less than a second. It's about a hundred thousandth of a second. But it allows us to make a calculation because it is the first moment in the history of the universe that we know exactly. We can't see it. Everything before this is speculation. Very good mathematics, lots of good speculation, but speculation. But this moment, we know. It's, it's called the year of nucleosynthesis, the threshold energy of protons. When matter forms, time grabs a hold. The first explosion is pure energy. Then the energy rapidly, in a very stretch, starts condensing into matter. And at the, it's called the threat, the energy or the temperature, I'm going to say it, is a level in which protons can form. Okay? Because of antiprotons, protons. Protons form the nucleus of atoms, right? The lightest of the, of the elements is hydrogen. The universe is about 75% hydrogen till today. And that's an atom with one proton. So matter forms here, and Nachmanis tells us the clock begins here. So the question would be, what would the view of time be from this point relative to here? Well, with the galaxy, I saw as a factor of two. Space is stretched by a factor of two. If I knew how much space had stretched from here to here, I could calculate how the 14 billion years would look from this perspective. For the galaxy experiment, two weeks, factor two, became one week. If I knew the stretching ratio from here to here, I would know how the 14 billion years would compress into this view. Notice it is not relativity. It's not gravity. It's not velocity. People make a mistake very often just here in graduate. It is totally the stretching of space. It has nothing to do with Einstein, except it was Einstein that told us that this could become this, that energy could become matter. But this relates not to the density of the universe, just to the stretching. And we know that number. How do we know it? Because the two scientists that earned the Nobel Prize for proving that Hoyle was wrong, the universe eternal, that they had a beginning, Arno Pentis and Robert Wilson at the Bell Labs in New Jersey, measured the energy level of space here, it's called the temperature of space, that the famous three degrees will go absolute zero. It's, it's very cold in space, put it that way. <laughs> not zero, but it's minus 450 Fahrenheit, okay? Minus 260, 270 centigrade. The temperature here, and we know this temperature not by observation, but by my, my doctorate's half in nuclear physics. We know this number because it's a nuclear physics number. We know the ratios of the energy of this to this, which is exactly the ratio of the stretching of space. Every time space stretches by a factor of two, the temperature drops by a factor of two, stretches by a factor of 10, drops by a factor of 10, and we discover, and these numbers have nothing to do with Schroeder. I, it's not my, my field is not astronomy, okay? That ratio is 900 billion. It's 900 with nine zeros after it. Which means the universe is 900 billion times larger, more stretched out here, than here. It's interesting that it's all billions, billions and billions. What it would mean is that I had 900 billion seconds worth of history. I don't know, the caveman or something, you know, that before Adam, it would look like one second from here. All the information is there, it's just all compressed. You notice that Genesis you know, chapter one only has 31 sentences. I mean, back at, at, at MIT, I'm sure at the Hayden Library, the, uh, there are probably 50,000 books, and up the, up the river at Harvard, they probably got 200,000 books at the, at the, at the Widener Library. You know? 
we get 31 sentences. Everything is compressed. If I, if, I had 900, if I had 900 billion minutes, it would look like one minute here. 900 billion hours would look like one hour here. And 14 billion years, Notice that it's unitless. It's not seconds, minutes, or hours. It's just a ratio. 14 billion years compressed by 900 billion. So lucky about this is it's the billion. Well, the zeros just drop off. And we're left with 14 years divided by 900, which equals 15 thousandths of a year. The age of the universe has perceived in the biblical point of view, it's not even a year. I mean, to get hung up on 15,000 a year, you know, you're pretty much a nitpicker. I mean, 15,000 a year is almost nothing. Well, it's not quite almost nothing. What is it for this? I think I'll change the years and the days by multiplying by 365. Any guesses for what you get? You get five and a half days. It's not a trick. That calculation for the science of God is best seller for the entire year on Amazon. And in this field, I'm not patting myself on the back for at least that just fine. What I am saying, though, is the following. You do not last on the bestseller list for a year. It's a trick. The beautiful, the beautiful part about this is the journal Nature. Anyone of the scientists here knows the name Nature. is one of the two leading science journals in the world. has given the stamp of approval to this approach for calculation. They use the identical approach with a different agenda. You should show sure the journal Nature is 100% secular. It's got to spin even more pro-secular than it's not just neutral. But the fact that the journal like that, of that status, peer-reviewed one of the two leading science journals in the world, says that this is a valid way of understanding the universe, removes from the table that this is not a valid way of looking at the universe. So what's the argument? The only argument of the web that exists at the moment, and there are over 30,000 references to this calculation of the web, is that Schroeder chose this moment to make it work. That's a lie. There's only one moment that worked. I don't know if the people are lying. They don't know me, so they just know me. They, don't the idea. they say I juggled around until I found the moment that worked. That is absolutely not true. I mean, one calculation. Because there's no, there's no wiggle room here. You could say there's wiggle room with how long are the days. There's no wiggle room. All three ancient commentaries say 24 hours, but contain all the ages of the universe. And, and the only place where this statement fits in matter form is when protons form. Protons are the essence of every the nucleus of every atom. You've got electrons out here and protons. So the ratio is this, and it comes out, in fact, to be five and a half days, which is encouraging because I hope the Bible is right. It was, and we waste a lot of time. Every morning, every morning you pray, you think you waste the time. So uh, we have a few minutes to get questions on this, so we can move to some, another topic as well. But uh, I, I, I mean, I'm very happy to hear discussions in any direction, yes, no, or you know, whatever. Yeah. Why is not time pertinent to the pre-formation of the nucleus? Oh, why? Is, why? I have no idea why. But now, Maimonides makes the statement: when matter forms, the clock grabs a hold. Initiation postpones mind. If he had not made that statement, I couldn't make a calculation because we wouldn't know where to put the number. But that's purely opinion. It's not. Well, it's not Maimonides. Not Maimonides makes the statement. He also said the Torah sees time from the beginning, looking forward. That's his opinion also. But it's all based on biblical statements going back a thousand years ago. It's not like it's a modern bending of the Bible. You know, so it, I mean, it predates our understanding of the age of the universe. It is his opinion, but he has a very good track record of being correct, of, of many, many insights into the text. It's called Kabbalah. He, he, he says, he, these aren't my ideas, he says. Kabbalah means I get it from my teachers, got it from their teachers going back to Sinai. And anyway, uh, yeah, John. Here. In one of your books, you take the six days. You show the first day three point five billion years. Seven. Can you yeah. elaborate that? Yeah, we can, this this is right off the web. If you want, and then the other side is, is is my overlay on this. Okay, this is right from the web. If you want a diagram of the cosmic history, anyone who's interested in anything more like the age of the universe or anything along that line, I urge you go to the web. Type in NASA, NASA, obviously, this is a good place for that. I don't know what this is called. And then type in WMAP. It's the initials for this satellite. WMAP, NASA, WMAP. This, this diagram is 
from a science point of view, is probably the most, from a science point of view, the strongest theological statement science will ever make relative to life, God, and you. This is our cosmic history in the universe. The black is nothing, not a vacuum, nothing. Vacuums are in here, empty space is here. This is the creation of the universe. This is the timeline of this direction. The universe expands in all directions. This is expansion over time. There's a burst of energy out of nothing, out of nothing. Nothing is something of which humans cannot conceive. You cannot abstract space from your thoughts. You cannot abstract time from your thoughts. Just the limits that humans have. Humans are limited. Unfortunately, sometimes things we're not. A creation of the universe, a burst of energy, and the universe expands over time. Every time, to answer John's question, then you get back to this question, then a few minutes on evolution. Every time the universe doubles in size, the perception of time has. So if we, if we forget all these zeros, okay, and take the exact ratio, you now this is highly rounded off, obviously. We forget the age of 14 billion years, forget it totally. Two numbers that we know with three figure accuracy. This, this value here of the energy level, I use the word temperature, I don't even temperature. The temperature that would be required from protons and the temperature of space today. We take that ratio, and that would be the ratio at this moment right here of the universe expanding rapidly. So the temperature is dropping, so the perception of time is changing rapidly. Now if I move two markers apart, let's say the universe is very small, and I'm moving the markers apart at a constant speed. Okay? When is the space between these markers doubling most rapidly? When the universe is small or when the universe is large? When does it double most rapidly? Small. small. It's not good. Great. Double, 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 double. It takes long, and remember, it's the doubling rate because you're always going back. Doubles by factor two, you have to cut the time effect, cut the factor effect. Doubles by factor three, three. So the double, the ratio, the the, it's, it's the right way of saying it, the fractional rate of change, it sounds like a too fancy word, the fractional rate of change is most rapid when the universe is small. The numbers that come out of the equation, I have no control over them whatsoever. These numbers are fixed, it's an exponential equation, half, half, a half, a half, a half. I don't plug in 14 billion years, I just take this ratio right here. I'll tell you, when the numbers came out, I get me right now. I, ran, I, was, I literally, I was covered with you know, I, ran, I said, Barbara, look at these numbers. The Bible might be true. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is pretty amazing. The first day has seven billion years. The second day has three and a half billion years. I have that, I have a copy of that essay with those issues. There's a slight correction with which I'm beholden to a, a person at Azusa. Azusa is a, uh, a university by California uh, who pointed out an error I, I was making, not the sign I was making, that the number of these numbers were slightly different. I'm so beholden, on my website, I acknowledge the thanks, and in the, in the essay that I, 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 John, uh, I discussed with many of them. What happens is, the first day is seven billion years, the second day is three and a half billion, half of that is one point eight billion. So you get to each day, once you know the duration of each day, you can calculate when the day started. That's what I have in, in, the, in the Science of God. And once you can calculate when the day started and ended, you can see the, the claims the Bible makes. And you can see the claims that science makes. The fidelity, the overlap, at least to me, makes it, I can, I, and it's enough to make you believe in God. In God. I mean, it's really amazing because they overlap. It's, look, there's, there's only two or three sentences there each day, so every nuance isn't there. But when you take the general statements, the flow is exactly correct. We look at the flow of life. The flow of life is exactly what the Torah talks about. It says life starts in the waters, it sits on day five, moves to the land, becomes mammal, becomes human. You get about six sentences for the animal the evolution of animal life. That's exactly the flow that the fossil record shows in 100,000 examples. Life starts on, animal life starts in the waters, moves to the land, becomes a million, becomes human. The question that remains is, when you use the word evolution, built in the American use of the term evolution, which is different than England, but the American use of the word evolution is random mutations 
make the progeny stronger, weaker, smarter, dumber. And everyone knows big lions eat little lions. I and mean, that's just the way the world is put together. So the second half of evolution is not random. So persons that push evolution will say, well, evolution isn't random. It's survival of the fittest, which is the circular sentence also. Because how do you define the, the fittest? By those that survive. So it's a circular sentence. So that, that's not random. Big lions beat up little lions. But the first part has to be random. The mutations have to be random. If they are not random, the word is not evolution, it's development. Development is different. Development says life started in the waters, development became land-based, became mammalian, became human. But it's, it's, it's not prejudicial. It doesn't say God did it, and it doesn't say nature did it. It just said this is what happened. And then you look at the data and you decide whether you really can logically say that life beings became alive. Because that's what NASA holds by. You talk about a theological statement of the universe, this is the only physical creation. All science holds by that. And out of that became things called people. Out of this, this is us here, 14 billion laters. So clever, it could make a satellite. Light beams learn to make satellites. That's what this said. This is the only physical creation. I can, if I said nothing else the whole time, this, you can go to my website and get this character to write the book. This is so phenomenal that the scientific community has accepted the fact that energy, energy comes in lots of terms, so it's called light beams. That super powerful light beams could change and graduate and graduate and finally become thinking. Where does a, a light beam have the chutzpah to grow? <laughs> you know, where does it get the, what a place a light beam? Boredom, excitement, but that's what this diagram says. And this is the, the condensed scientific knowledge of the world today. This is your cosmic history, as well as the table's cosmic thing, and the floor you're standing on. <coughs> Energy became alive. It's a phenomenal statement. And if you think that's evolution, you've got a good imagination. I would call it development, but even then we don't understand it. But that's the reality of the world, how it happened. Yeah, we know energy can change into matter. Einstein figured that out. And you have 14 billion years. But even so, 14 billion years, I mean, life starts immediately on the Earth. The oldest rocks can have fossils, already have fossils in them. You can't get any earlier information than that. It was like 3.6 billion years. And it wasn't people sleeping for lectures. It was, it was something much more simple, like bacteria. <coughs> life, life invents DNA. All forms of life are the same. If you came from outer space, all you could see was, was the, the genetic information. You think we're cousins of, of, of that pine tree, or the you know, whatever palm tree, whatever it is. Because we are. We have the same DNA, just with different information on it. Nature went digital immediately. Unlike a computer, which is binary, or like on and off, plus or minus, you know, zero and one. So we're quarter, we're four, we're four based digital code. The four nucleic acids, but all of nature is that. It's exactly the same. And there's been no change, it's amazing. Why hasn't, why hasn't nature, you know, there's no, history, there's no evidence that we have today that there was an evolution or a development of the DNA. It's the same. Whether you're a bacterium, it, it, how it's organized in these, within the cells, that's one thing. But the system for reading the information, you know, if you remember, the reader is really the amazing thing. I mean, you have a book in Hebrew. If there were no, no Hebrew, the book might as well be in Greek. Which is amazing. <laughs> but, you know, so, but the system is the same. Why hasn't it evolved? I take the other basic system for storing information. It's called language. We developed that. Humans developed that. Language is all phenomenal. I mean, just go to China, try to read Chinese countries, or try to read Hebrew, you know, if you don't know, or Greek, I mean, or Russian. Not only did language evolve over time, it evolved laterally also over space. In other words, because even right at this moment, all language isn't the same. So we see that, the, that if a biological system called people were developing an information storage system, there'd be huge changes, huge changes as we see from languages today. Why did DNA go through that? It got it right the first time around. Nature got it right the first time around. And it leads you to wonder whether it's really just randomness. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a friendly crowd today, so most people probably believe it. But the fact is, even, even when you put a person in the corner that is, that is secularist, Richard Dawkins, the, he's a nice guy. He's very highly f funded, so we think he's very, very bright. Okay? He's very highly funded. But he writes in his book, In the God Delusion, he says, two things in our history are strokes of luck. Those are his words, strokes of luck. The origin of life from non-living matter and the origin of consciousness within that life 
that came from London. I mean, what else is there to do? God, debate. You know how a fish becomes a frog? It's not even interesting. But the fact that, but that, that even there's no answer. Rocks in four billion, a bit under four billion years ago, rocks and water and a few simple molecules became alive, produced microbes. How? I mean, what is a rock? Right about to be, you know, in other words, and then consciousness in that life. In fact, that's, that's what there's George Wall, and also, I mean, major persons who have realized that it's, it's more than a stroke of luck, it's just complex beyond work. Can I go a few minutes? It's after one, so many people have, 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 have to get out of here. A few more minutes? <laughs> but I, I gotta get my sheets back. Okay. The, uh, in this diagram, just quickly, because I just want to touch a little bit on evolution. Okay, but just first of all, you'll notice, you'll notice that in this diagram that the creating force is a quantum fluctuation. In other words, an aspect of the laws of nature. Okay? And this is, remember, this is not, this has nothing to do with me, this is straight off the web. Okay? The, the, what this diagram says is that the laws of nature could create the universe from nothing. And that happens to be true. The idea that we learn in grade school, or you know, early, even sometimes in humanities in, in university, that nothing comes from nothing and nothing ever will. And there's a wonderful musical called <laughs> The Sound of Music, right? And they're singing in the garden, and where they say, nothing comes from nothing and nothing ever will. It's true related to love, okay? I've been married for far over 30 years, so they can't, they can't take love. It takes love, takes work, as anyone knows, right? But, the, but, the, but as far as Science goes, it's not true. You can get something from nothing, provided you have the laws of nature. So look what this diagram is saying. Let me try to the first thing I the first thought of this idea 40, 40 years ago. Now it's the understanding. Instead of the big word, quantum fluctuation, it's called the laws of nature. Okay, it's an aspect of nature. That is to say, the laws of nature, according to the scientific community, not, not Bible thumpers, according to the scientific community, the laws of nature predate the universe. Which means, of course, they predate our understanding of time. If the laws of nature aren't nature, they're information, they're, they're wisdom, they're, they're an idea, to use the, phys the physics term, information or an idea. So we have something that's not physical, the laws of nature, that's not physical, that is outside of time, predates time, that can create the universe from the end. Now that should sound very familiar. Not physical, outside of time, eternal, created the universe. Sounds like God. And it is the definition of God, except for one other aspect. Is that which created the universe interested in the universe created? The Bible would say yes. Science would say, you know, you know give me some argument, but, I would rather, but, I'm just, but it is the definition of God. The only, the only ad adjective that would go, the adjunct to that would be, is it interested in the, in the universe it created? One example then just, would God logically use the laws of nature, namely a quantum fluctuation to create the universe? Why not? If you invent the laws, you might as well use them. So, so it's, is that consistent with the biblical understanding of God? Does God, when possible, use nature to interact with the world? And the answer, exactly, it's a strong statement, yes. i just give one quick example of this. In about, about six or seven weeks from now, even less actually, uh, about, about five weeks, they have a holiday called Passover, the Exodus holiday. The, the, the Israelites come out in the ten plagues, I'm looking at the ten plagues, the discovery chapter goes that all the time. They, they, they have just had another special on how the plagues can be. Leave that aside. God is leading the Israelites, pillar of fire by night, pillar of fire by day, and banks them on the banks of the Yam Suf. Yam means sea, and Suf means reeds. It could also be soap. The Hebrew Bible is written without vowels. It could be soap or soup. Yam soap would be the end of the sea. Yam soup means the sea of reeds, which means that it was it, it, a reed could be about at least ten meters tall. So you don't have a, you don't have hundreds of meters or whatever. You got something you know it could be ten, twenty meters enough to cover this ground cover. But anyway, in any event, the Israelites get there. They're trapped in. The Egyptians are now are chasing after them. The vice is closing. Petitionary prayer, they pray to God, and God answers them. God splits the sea for them. Anybody know how, what, what splits the sea? Exactly. Exodus chapter 14, verse 21. God makes a strong east wind blow all night. Look at all the information we're giving. Not just the wind, 
but an east wind. Not just an east wind, but a strong east wind. Not just a strong east wind, but a strong east wind that blows all night. What's the Bible breaking my head for? There's going to be a wind already. I have to go, I mean, a wind, a strong wind. I mean, you know, who needs it already? You need it. You know you need it because what happens next? The sea opens. The Israelites go in. Who follows them right on in? Egyptians. It's a wind. That's why I need the information. That wind had to look so natural. So natural. And after the Israelites go in, the, the Egyptians, it's, it's a wind. So the lucky, you know, lucky guys got a wind. Let's go right in after. Only when the waters are coming back, they say, Yachalimi, God is fighting for the Israelites. Right? They realized it wasn't natural. But it took that act to do it. It looked natural going in. So the question I would arise immediately is, yeah, I did. Could a wind split the sea? I mean, really, it's a bit of a stretch. But luckily, two scientists, one by the name of Dolph, one by the name of Polder, decided to see if a wind could split the sea, where they assumed that no one knows exactly where, but generally picky. And so if they, they didn't take a big fan down there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they might have done it, but they didn't. They were more modest. They were computer scientists, and they plotted, they plotted in, they plotted into the computer, the, uh, the topography, the hills where they assumed, and they turned on a strong east wind that blew all night, 40 miles an hour, out of the east, they probably tried many, and the slowest wind was 40 miles. But anyone that drives in a car at 40 miles an hour can easily hold his hand. It's a wind, but it doesn't blow your arm back. So it's a wind. What's interesting about that is not just some guy who you know, talks about the Bible a lot, talks about it. That's not interesting. What's interesting is Nof and Paldo published their results in the world's leading peer reviewed journal. Everyone knows what peer review means? Other scientists try to knock it out the world's leading peer-reviewed journal of meteorology. The Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. It's the top of the mountain for meteorology. It's peer-reviewed. Are there oceanographic explanations for the Israelites crossing the Red Sea? I urge you to get on the way. And the answer is yeah. 40 miles an hour, out of the east, you do it every time. Yeah. So the other, I don't have the other article in, in my, where they publish later how often you expect such a wind. Was a huge error bracket on it. There's not much wood there, not so a lot of data from that area. But they came up to once every two or three thousand years to expect such a wind. So what's the miracle? It's exactly what they see in the real estate. Location. <laughs> Location and timing. Location and timing would be a miracle. God works through nature. If God wants to use a quantum fluctuation to create the universe, you know, if you say he would take your soul, let it be his will to do it. Why not? Because you meant you meant it, you might have been using it. There are other times when it's not so obvious, but these were the easy things. So I think because it's getting we've we'll, got ten minutes over. Uh, any other questions or thoughts? Well but this gentleman had his name for some I heard many, both, both, now most, remember, multiverses is many, many universes, not just galaxies, other universes with different laws of nature, and different laws of nature, so you have, you know, a near infinite number of universes, one of them is going to work. When you're changing, one of them is going to come out just right. And in fact, a, uh, the Bible doesn't talk either way about that. I did hear a, a biblical, I'm talking about this man named Joseph Salavatia, because he died about, about 10 years ago. In the European Jewish community that he called the Ashkenazi, he was the you know, right. He was the leading, the leading expert. He didn't talk about both the universes, but he, what he did talk about was uh, other life elsewhere in our universe. And he said the following. I was standing next to him. I wouldn't have the nerve to stand next to him. But he said, when he was asked the question, is it possible that there's life elsewhere in this universe? And he said the following, as far as I understand the Bible, and you too, as far as in the Jewish community, there's no problem with life existing elsewhere in the universe. The Torah deals with the earth and our part. I would say if there's life elsewhere in the universe, it's absolute proof of God. Absolute proof. You're not going to get life twice. It's so complicated to get it once even amazingly. But as far as multiverses go, a few years ago, Scientific American, not peer reviewed, but the most widely read science journal of the year in the world by far, by a factor of 10. Everyone who's in Scientific American. <laughs> Infinite Earths and parallel universes really exist. That's the multiverse. This gentleman, what's your first name? Yeah. I was talking about here that there are many universes, and most of them are losers, but one could be a winner. We're in the winner, obviously, because a loser, we're not people here. 
infinite parallel universe really exist? Not a question, really exist. And the chutzpah is, 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 there, is their explanation why they really exist. And here it is, four color printed. Cosmologists infer, notice the back clearing out, cosmologists infer the presence of level two parallel universes, or the universe of parallel, by scrutinizing the properties of our universe. These properties include the all the laws of nature, etc., how they're perfect, were a form, were established by random processes, assumption, during the birth of our universe. Yet they have exactly the value to sustain life. That suggests the existence of other universes with other values that don't sustain life. Of course, it suggests nothing of the sort. You understand, you know, that, but it's embarrassing that a scientific journal, and people will read it, oh, yeah, 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 they said. The fact is, the fact that our universe is perfect in no way implies that there are other universes that are not. But they say on the cover that it proves it. The only way, in fact, what comes out now of uh, Bernard Carr and or Imperial University is, in London says, if you don't want God, you better have both universes. If you don't want God, you better have both universes. Our universe is just too good to be true. So we're going to take a look at the final question. Sorry. I'm going to ask this question. I'm not sure. You know, right now, I'm 97.6. idea that the universe is the expression of this information called, called the laws of nature and then the, the laws of nature will be God's thoughts is that with death as far as physics would say today to be completely non-prejudicial death would mark the end of the body's participation in life death does not mark the end of life death marks the end of the body's participation in life our chapter today our chapter this time is a portion of life just in a body. It gives us certain challenges, etc., etc. But that's not life. Even physicists hold by that. Nobel laureate physicists hold by the me. Who is the me? The me isn't this stuff. The me, the me is a mind out here that contacts with this stuff by the brain. The mind is separate. The brain mind the brain mind analogy is the radio and the radio waves. Take the radio, smash it on the ground. The radio waves aren't affected, they're out there just fine. The brain is the radio, the radio waves are the mind. The brain's the antenna that picks up the mind. The reason my phone isn't ringing now, I happen to forget to shut it off. The reason it's not phone ringing now is this room has probably 20,000 radio messages going through it right now. So why isn't my phone ringing? Because my phone is tuned to a certain frequency that it picks up. Okay? The same as your brain. There's a mind out there, it's probably a universal mind, but your, only, your brain is only tuned into a very small part of that, a minuscule part. And that's the part you pick up by your brain, because your brain's the antenna that picks it up and you're tuned to it. I think we've got to end here because it's really late and... Uh,